Thank you. Good evening, three-dimensional humans. <laughs> uh, welcome to the, what is it, July uh, 2021 meeting of the Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems. Let us start with introductions, which is going to be kind of an interesting affair. It took me forever to figure out how to do it on a screen, and now I get to do it in both reels time and out of time. So let's start with the screen. Um, Dr. Crocker? Hi, everybody. This is like very cool. So I'm Abby Crocker. I'm at uh, UVM and also at the National Center on Restorative Justice. Great. Thank you. Chief Stevens. I'm Don Stevens, Chief of the Nolhegan uh, Abenaki Tribe. Thank you. Uh, Mo, Mo West. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mo West. I'm from Search. I think you'll be hearing a little bit more from me in the uh, very near future of who I am and why I'm here. Great. Thank you. Pepper. Hey, uh, it's James Pepper. I'm the uh, chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Great. And congratulations on being out the physical and remote meeting setting. Not easy to do. Dude, this was the grace of the divine. Okay, I mean, thank you, but this was this was beyond human intervention. <laughs> oh, Captain Scribner, my partner. Hi, I am Captain Julie Scribner. I am here representing Commissioner Sherman <clears throat> for the Department of Public Safety. Great. Ah, oh, my eyes. Alona Tate. Hi, um, I'm Alana Tate. I'm here from DCF Adolescent Services Unit. Great, thank you. Julio Thompson. Hi, sorry I'm not on video tonight. Uh, Julio Thompson, Civil Rights Unit Attorney General's Office. Great, thanks. Uh, David, does that go down so I can see if there are more people? Scroll on that chat. Thank you. We all. Rebecca, you're, you're the last person on the screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Turner, panel member and representing the Office of the Defender General. Great. Thank you. And then we'll just go around the room. Ev uh, Evan Maynan from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director. I am over here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Tyler Allen. I'm the commissioner designated appointee from um, uh, Department for Children and Families. I work with Alana Tate in the uh, Adolescent Services Unit. I'm Jessica Brown. I'm uh, one of the Attorney General at large community member appointees. Um, I used to work at the Public Defender Office, but now I work at the Vermont Law School. Um, Professor Brown. Uh, <laughs> I'm Eitan Nasred and Longo, Attorney General appointee and chair of the panel. Sheila Linton, she, her, um, panel member at large and representing the Root Social Justice Center. Karen Gannett with Crime Research Group and we're one of the consultants named in the statute. Uh, Ian Loris, uh, I'm Eitan Summer Assistant. David Chair, Assistant Attorney General representing the Attorney General's Office. And we've done it. I think Robin is on the phone, actually. Oh, yeah, there was a phone number. Yeah. Oh, Robin, are you there? I am. Hi. Robin Joy, Crime Research Group. Great. Thank you, Karen. And, Thank you, Robin. And TV and community. I'm sorry? TV and community. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Martin, Martin Malone, representative of uh, the Judiciary Committee, the Coast Judiciary Committee. Great. Did I get everybody? I think, okay. Um, apologies from, I mean, Monica Weaver's on her, oh, no, wait, there's Jen from Gotham City. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, everything, I've got windows flying open everywhere here. Christmas. 
<laughs> Go ahead, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Jen Furpo. I'm a training coordinator with the Vermont Police Academy. Um, I coordinate domestic violence response and fair and impartial policing. Um, Judge Grierson sends regrets. He will not be able to be with us tonight. Um, I'm trying to remember. Monica Weaver is on her way. I, but of course, given this hybrid form, I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but she's on her way. She's running late. Those are the two that I know of. Uh, and we're going to just sort of launch in. Um, I, yeah, we're just going to launch in. I would start with the minutes. I made a mistake, which Dr. Brown has pointed out to me. <laughs> She's like, okay, like, afraid. stop now. Um, she, but just pointed out to me, I... We met on the 11th of May, and those minutes are somewhere in this box. They did not make it to you. For that, I apologize and will send them out as soon as I can. Um, the 13th of April and the 4th of May, however, remain outstanding according to my... I have a list that I keep of minutes that pass and votes and stuff and we talked but we didn't vote on them which I don't quite understand so it would be really helpful to me if we could do that and get that in so that those T's and I's are appropriately marked um, so I'd like to turn our attention to the approval of the minutes from 13 April to begin with I move to approve and adopt the minutes from Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes from the 13th of April? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Um, I'll abstain simply because I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> we have one abstention because he wasn't there. Um, minutes are approved, thank you. Fourth of May now, if we could turn our attention to those minutes. Um, are there corrections, amendments? I'll move to approve them. We have a motion to approve the minutes. Is, are they, is that seconded? I'll second. Thank you. Okay, seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say something. Something. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and all abstaining. <laughs> I'll abstain. I was not present. Tyler was absta abstaining because he wasn't present. It carries. We approve those minutes as well. Thank you very much. All right. Uh... Announcements. I basically gave you those. Um, well, not all of them. Uh, as you're going to note, we're spending an enormous amount of time really tonight on Act 65 and the working group that the Act um, allows us to put together. Um, it actually directs us to put together. Um, there are a couple things that I wanted to put out there before we get going that you need to know. Um, the first is, and I think in a certain way it's kind of important, that the $50,000 appropriation went through. It did not, however, cover the increased ask for the community members. Um, I feel badly about that. Uh, I know that both Representative Lalonde and Coach Christie fought very hard for it, but it did not happen. So that for people who choose to be on the working group, that will be at the same rate that we were working at last summer. Um, there's still mileage, of course. Those things will be covered. But the, the, there's no bump up that we were hoping for. That's another issue that will have to be taken up another day that 
uh, the state doesn't just get labor for uh, rather low wages, I might add. However, we do have the money in order to enable us to partner with the people that the Act covers. So, Crime Research Group, National Center, and I always get this wrong, for or of restorative justice? For. For. On. Pardon? It's actually National Center on restorative justice. On. Well, I've got it totally wrong. I'm going to like try to mark that, forgive me, National Center on Restorative Justice, UVM, um, and so it should be able to, to cover those expenses. Um, I just wanted to point that out before we got going because when we get to the moment of um, actually trying to put the working group together, um, we're going to, that's just an issue. It's going to be an issue for the community members, and I wanted to put that out front before we got going. The other thing that I want to do is Act 55 has swelled us to some extent, um, formally, legitimately, legally. Director Davis is now a voting member of the panel. <laughs> now I'm a and, yeah, and now we're in trouble. <laughs> And then she will also be appointing two community members um, in due course um, when you get there. But that will be happening. But I wanted to just uh, mark that so that we all know that there have been some changes. Um, and that's about all that I had to say in, in, in introduction. Are there any other announcements, people? want to make or need to make or feel they'd like to make. And I guess that would be a no. So, on to the regular part of the agenda. Um, Mo West, who will introduce himself in due course, um, remember, when, remember when we were looking at our report from um, last Dece December 2019, I guess it was, and uh, I know I forgot there was a year in there. Uh, but there, remember that report and there was that really fetching drawing that was started by um, the data officer, Kristen McClure. And Pepper had a bit of a hand in that as well. And that drawing initially started out, I'm fixated on that drawing. It started out very, very simple. Very, very clean. There were little boxes and little discrete, appropriate lines between the boxes that the data flows from here to here, and it looked fine. And then we were meeting with all of the IT people among various parts of the criminal justice system. And by the end of the meeting, we came up with that horror that is at the bottom of page 25, or page 5, I guess, of the report. Which, as you'll know, and I've been telling people in the legislature, looks like Escher. Um, it's truly evil. Now, I met with Mo and Karen and Robin actually on Friday, and Mo said <laughs> that he didn't find that drawing all that daunting. Mm -hmm. You'll also remember that there was a moment at which which was a big part of the report, we talked about how we needed experts in order to make that drawing, which makes people crazy, um, make sense. So Mo, thinking that this is not a particularly complicated drawing, like he's seen worse, which tells you something, right? Um, actually is someone who does data integration, which seems to me, certainly given our earlier report, and what we're being asked to do now, an important issue. And he thought he'd have some thoughts to deliver on that. So I invited him and figured we'd listen to him and then afterward do the nuts and bolts of putting together the working group. So, Mo, take it away and make that drawing like less terrifying. <laughs> well, I, actually, I don't know if I'm going to make it less terrifying. I'm saying that's a really good start and it's going to become even more complicated and increasingly level of detail. And there's going to be multiple pages of iterations of that drawing. 
but thank you for that introduction. Um, I hope to not disappoint um, after that, but a couple of caveats. This is our number um, nine for me on, on Zoom calls today. I might be a little brain fried right now. Um, and I'm just hoping that my headset doesn't die before the next 20 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, like, like Yitan said, my name is Mo West and I'm from Search. And just to give you a little bit of background and context on, on who I am and, and what we do at Search, Search is a national nonprofit uh, technical assistance organization. We started about 50 years ago with this concept of taking um, criminal history records and making them electronic and sharing them across state lines and with the FBI. And, it, and actually, I was just telling Karen and, and Robin and Natan earlier this week that I've been working for SEARCH for about 12 years now and just realized a couple of years ago that SEARCH actually is an acronym for the Systematic Electronic Access and Retrieval of Criminal Histories. And it's been going on for a long time. And after 50 years, I think we get the criminal history part mostly sorted out. Uh, but we've expanded beyond there to broader aspects of criminal justice administration and particularly technology application to criminal justice business process. And so when Etan referenced that, that drawing, I said, that's actually a pretty um, straightforward, high level data flow of what generally happens not just in Vermont, but across the country. So we all do the same thing, just a little bit differently. And, and my early involvement, or I guess my, my more recent involvement with um, uh, Vermont is that we've been doing some work with the National Criminal Justice Reform Project. And for the folks that are on this committee and that committee, I apologize in advance. Uh, you're going to hear a, a similar message from what uh, I delivered to them, um, you know, probably over the last 18 months or so. But Etan and, and, and Karen in particular thought it might be helpful to kind of share some of the same messages um, that, that I was um, trying to explain to them and how this could be applicable to the, the RDEP um, um, initiative, because there are similar conversations going on in Vermont in terms of we need access to data and how do we go about to establish an interoperable system that can provide this data, knowing that there's lots of pieces and silos of information scattered across not just criminal justice, which is more um, you know, my, my area of expertise, but then what are the additional data sets when we're talking about racial disparities? There's a lot of other components that, that are involved there. Um, but even just within the, the, the sphere of, of criminal justice, you have state stakeholders, you have federal stakeholders, you have local stakeholders, you have um, lots of different partners that are involved in this. And, and the message I think was, was very similar or common uh, among these two initiatives with um, NCJRP and RDAP is that we need access to information and we don't necessarily know all of the components of where this information resides and we don't even know all the questions that we're looking to ask. Um, and so my, my approach to this is that, you know, when you, you're talking about you need access to data for a particular reason and you don't necessarily know the entire landscape, which you've already done some work in the, in the report that I've seen and from the conversations that, that I've had earlier, it seems like you have done um, a fair amount of work. You have an idea of where, what kind of data that you're looking for in the high level and where that could potentially um, exist or where that could come from. And one of the things, the messages that I try to share with folks is that Vermont's not alone and that even though it could be frustrating and almost seem like it's a um, impossible task to begin this process, that it is possible and other states are working on the same, same types of initiatives, same types of access to data and they come into the same challenges that, that you are, but that we really need to start with something that I've, after I looked at the report and had these conversations, that um, the scope of this could potentially be enormous in terms of just a technical um, challenge. And, and how do you coordinate all of these various pieces or data sources that you're looking at? And so one of the first things that, that came to mind as we were um, having this discussion is that really starting with um, a, a scoping process, identifying or establishing some consensus with the stakeholders that are around this table and, and having those other discussions what what makes the most sense in terms of a short-term 
realistic, achievable um, process can we start and then build from that to be scalable and to include other data sets as you identify those and those become more important and, and um, um, you know, necessary for what you're looking to do. Um, and, and, and the way that, that we typically do this in, in establishing a, a governance structure around this is, and this is going to sound very consultancy, but we establish an enterprise architecture. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we all come to an agreement on what the scope is, what the rules of engagement are, what the process is for approaching different stakeholders that have data that you need access to, and how do we set up a process for sharing that information. And that's basically what it is, but it gets much, much more involved when you talk about the policies, the practices, the technologies that are involved, who sees what and when, and you get into a, a very granular level of detail that will eventually need to happen. Um, but I would think that right now, I, we don't necessarily want to get into that level of detail, and I don't want to scare you off um, with, with that, that discussion. Um, but that's basically what the message that, that I had shared with the, uh, the folks for the criminal justice reform program is establishing those roles and responsibilities. And, and I hate to say it, Etan, but everyone here is going to have a role in that process. You're not going to necessarily be design, designing interfaces from one system to the next, but as the token technology guy here, and I confess I am not a subject matter expert in any kind of um, racial justice um, um, policies or, or kind of understanding what the policies are that go into this, but from the technology standpoint, we need very clear an explicit direction on what it is that you're looking for. And so you don't want to leave it to just the tech guys to, to figure out, okay, let's just go and design some interfaces and we're going to pull in all this data from all sorts of places and we're going to be enlightened with all the information that we have. In fact, it, it would be quite the opposite that you might get a whole lot of data that makes no sense and is not useful for you at all. And that's, I think, precisely what we try to want to avoid. And so the, the message that I shared um, earlier with the NCJRP folks is to really establish that governance structure and, and that governance and direction comes from policy subject matter experts that are sitting around this table right here and being very concise and, and specific on where, what direction that you're looking to go. And then we can get into another level of detail, kind of peel that onion back uh, a layer and work on specific requirements. What are the data elements that you're looking for? How do we want to structure those? And then taking those requirements, building that into you know, some, some software and some logic to have the, uh, the technology systems interact with each other. But um, I, I don't want to go on forever and wax poetic about this stuff. I can for a while, but again, like I said, this is hour nine. Um, and so I, I don't want to get into a level of detail, but um, that, that's going to bore you guys to death knowing it's a later hour there than it is in the Pacific Northwest here. Um, but I do want to, to share with you that there, there is expertise in Vermont, in state government, that can help guide you through this process. The folks at, at ADF, the ones who originally did the, um, the, the data flow, that terrible drawing, they understand that stuff and they can help facilitate some of these discussions that we're talking about um, here and that it is involved and it is complex and it's gonna take time and resources and dedication and effort among all the folks here, but also from the, uh, the other individuals that are involved to establish and document um, this enterprise architecture you know, series of documents that, that I was referring to. But not only will it take involvement and expertise from the folks that are in Vermont, in particular ADS, because they do have that skill set. I can't speak to whether or not they have the bandwidth or the capacity to take this on um, anytime in the near future, but at least that is an option available to you that they can help guide you through this process. Um, but then also, it's not just a, an ADS um, issue that can help design this, this um, enterprise architecture, but when you're talking about creating a, a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, that's going to require um, a whole lot of resources um, in and of itself. And if it's going to be kind of this standalone entity, which I, it may or may not be, I, I think that's you know, subject to, to uh, further discussion and decisions, but there's going to need to be some staffing and dedicated resources to making this a priority when you're going out and talking about collecting data, that someone's going to have to coordinate this, 
There's going to have to be someone sitting at meetings, taking taking notes, doing after action items, managing a project among many different stakeholders, and and being held accountable um, not only to the folks sitting around this table, but also uh, to the legislature, making sure that you know whatever it is that you're designing, if that's a series of data dashboards, or if you're providing information to a crime research group to under, make sure that they have the necessary information that they have so that they can do analysis on that. Um, it's, it's, it could be a significant undertaking. And, and I just wanted to share that in my previous experience working with the state of Washington when I managed a, a statewide information sharing program that we had a staff of six people that were dedicated to just doing criminal justice administration. We were really just focusing on e-citations and criminal history uh, or disposition reporting from the courts to the criminal history repository. Those were two big initiatives, but this has the potential to even be much broader than that and involve uh, many, many more stakeholders. So I just want to um, share that, not in terms of um, trying to dissuade anyone from this, but being realistic about the, the level of effort that it can take to, uh, to get this going here. So I will pause there for any questions or comments or reactions, thoughts, um, things along those lines. If you do want some more detail about anything that I said, I'd be happy to, to follow up here, but I thought that might be a good point to say. Any questions? I just wanted to add something. Um, so I'm on the NCJRP committee with um, Mo. Mo is one of the technical assistance providers on the committee. We're working with the National Governors Association and the National Criminal Justice Association. And um, a grant we received is funding that project. And so when this whole data integration initiative started with RDAP, I asked them, because it's so similar to the work we've been doing in NCJRP, um, I asked the um, national TA providers if we could use Mo's expertise for this project and they said yes and they will fund it because it's so similar to what we're already doing. So I wanted to make sure folks know that there's not additional money needed for Mo's expertise. Lovely. <laughs> you get what you pay for though. If it's free, yeah, you know. That was no a good thing. <laughs> And I was just going to ask you, Mo, could you talk a little bit about some of the work you've done in Vermont and your familiarity with the criminal justice data in Vermont? Yeah, and I could say that from the, the, our organization's perspective, my direct involvement has been pretty limited. Um, but I would say 10 years ago, and Robin, you can feel free to chime in on this as well, that um, we started working with the folks uh, with VGIS to work on kind of an enterprise architecture type um, solution for sharing incident level information. And I think we created a portal so that particularly law enforcement agencies could quickly access um, information that was contained in another agency's records management system. And I think that's grown over the course of the years. And I think the original idea with VGIS was to kind of do this coordinating um, uh, role that I was describing in, in terms of establishing a true enterprise architecture. I think things have kind of gone in a, in a slightly different direction, but um, for the past, yeah, I would say 10 years at least, we've been working with um, stakeholders in Vermont um, and primarily the folks at DPS and, and VGIS to kind of create this infrastructure that's still there. It's available. Yeah. Um, the same process that we had set up there it applies to lots of different um, scenarios and contexts. It's not just necessarily limited to criminal justice and law enforcement. Chief Stevens, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want to say I appreciate your insights, Mo. As a director of IT and project manager myself, I understand uh, a lot of these pitfalls. Um, and I think one advantage Vermont has even though it might be separate but similar is Vermont took a huge undertaking for the Vermont Information Health Exchange where they had to get information from a lot of different places and have a national or a Vermont repository with a lot of uh, HIPAA you know security and all kinds of other things so I think there's some expertise out there um, that have done this before that people could learn the pitfalls that they might run into or maybe use it as a model even though it's coming from different places different data but the architecture is the same and the 
and the access and getting data to a centralized repository is similar. And maybe they, not everything has to be reinvented. So I just wanted to throw that out there to the to the committee that um, you know Vermont has had to work out a lot of bugs and it cost them millions of dollars. So they 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 have uh, a lot of expertise. Uh, I think Vital uh, helped with that. Um, the Vermont Information Technology leaders. So there there is some people that could um, um, be tapped into. I just wanted to say that, um, and I appreciate your insights, Mo. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Rebecca. And Rebecca, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Before I get to my question, and I just wanted to to sit on on Chief Stevens' point in terms of really the criticalness of identifying who else agencies within state government that have already tried to do integrative data work. Um, I was I, I just recently, um, well, I knew about it, but need to explore further the AHS um, effort um, on, on, a, on a similar sort of data collection aggregation analysis role. So I, I think when you talk, Mo, about not needing to worry about reinventing the wheel for our specific project, we need not even look very far um, and, and right. see. And I know there are lots of efforts. In, um, but my question here, and I, and I appreciate you speaking with us and sharing your expertise, uh, and you talked about the importance of establishing um, a governance structure as, as a key starting point. Sure, we stay grounded. Everyone in this effort stays grounded. Who do you think are critical? Because you sort of quickly identified stakeholders. Who do you see are critical stakeholders in that governance body? I would defer to Etan on that one. I don't know the stakeholders well enough uh, and kind of what your objectives are to, to really make an informed comment about that. Um, but certainly I would say, aside from the policy decisions that you're looking at, looking at those project management IT resources who need to be in the room to understand the context of, of what it is that you're trying to accomplish so that they're aware of it. Um, that would be the only kind of perspective that I have and say who, who should or needs to be in their room just to give them that, that foundation of the kind of the business or the policy um, concerns that you have. But I would defer to the folks around the table to say who else needs to be in here. Well, that would, that was sort of a question that I would actually ask it with Sheila in a way. I, I mean, I know you have an at, you're not in my head, but I mean that when we wrote the report, there was some there was a lot of concern about community involvement in defining not merely um, the governing body for this bureau, but also defining. What data are does do those communities see as important themselves, and that being part of am I getting this right? That that was part of what we thought would be important, and this would sort of lead to a question I had for you, Mo. I just want to get this really clearly on the record. Your point would be that that kind of sorting should happen before the data technical stuff, right? Is that correct? Sorry, I lost you for a second there. That sort of... Okay, yeah. that, the sort of sorting that, a commu that communities would do, that historically stigmatized communities would want to sit and talk about what kind of data they might feel are important. There's been a lot written on this about how the data that communities might themselves feel are important are not always considered important by policymakers. So what I'm saying is, would you just make that clear again, that sorting that communities would be doing needs to happen, if I'm understanding you correctly, before the technical part that you're involved in. Um, 100 percent. I will say that in, in my world as a technology person, we call those requirements. 
And what it is that you need is dependent upon what you need. Um, the IT folks really shouldn't have a whole lot of insight on trying to tell you what it is that you need. The flip side of that equation is that you can ask for anything under the sun, but there's going to be a negotiation probably based on what's realistically available. And, and that's going to be, you know, I, I can't speak to that at all. If, if you're asking for stuff that just Sometimes it doesn't exist in administrative data, which is what we're what we're basically talking about. Not everything is captured, but I think going through that requirements identification process, especially kind of building upon um, what you had done before with identifying those kind of high level, yeah, like this kind of information um, about you know courts or charges or you know interpreters being available, some of those things. Some of that stuff will certainly be there in the criminal justice world. There's a lot of uh, really good. Um, historical sets of, of information that are there. Certainly not everything that anybody could possibly dream up, um, but that's part of that discussion um, with, with not even the technical folks, but really understanding the, the subject matter experts who are understand what the business is on how they operate their respective organizations, that they know what data they have and then they know what data they don't have. Um, so those two groups, kind of identifying those requirements, understanding what's potential or what's what's possible, um, marrying those two up and saying, okay, here's what we have and here's what we want. That's when you tell the technology folks, okay, we know this data exists here. Here's what we want and when. And uh, Eitan, I'd, like yes. I'd like to answer Rebecca's question on who should be on the, the, the governance committee. Usually a governance committee is those people in charge of different systems that has the authority to make the changes or make the data consistent. Because like, uh, just because someone might be collecting it as X, Y, Z, and somebody may be collecting it as John Smith, you can't put those in the same fields because they don't, they don't work together. So everything has to be X, Y, Z, or it has to be something else to be consistent. So that way you can sort and analyze and understand the data. So data governance means that the people who can make those decisions to make that consistent, to, to agree on what that consistency is, that's the people that you need in the room. Uh, because you could have somebody that can say, yes, I want this, but if they don't have the authority to make those changes, then, um, then you're running into trouble. Or at least someone those stakeholders can um, a point to represent them and bring the information back, but you have to have consistent data, or you keep, or the data won't be any any good. So that that's the only. I just want to throw the data governance is different than what you need or what the what the policy is. Once you find out what you need, then you got to make it consistent, so you can actually look at it in a, in the same manner. That was the point that. Tyler, you were making earlier on to Morgan about the authority to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Other questions, uh, Witchy. Witchy, introduce yourself. You came on when we, uh, after we had done all that. So just briefly, just let us know who you are. <laughs> Sure. So my name is Wichi Artu, pronouncing him his, say them theirs. Uh, I live in Athens, Vermont. That's in Wyndham County. Um, I wear a lot of hats right now. I'm just a community person. And also, uh, I'm a data engineer. Very specifically, I do uh, data warehouse technology, which is sort of what y'all are talking about. Um, I just wanted to add one uh, aspect that I think hasn't been named yet, um, and that is time. And it's like, how soon do you want this? Because that's really going to tell you like how much resource you're going to have to put into it, what it is realistically that you're going to be able to put together. So just want to also put that on the table as a consideration. OK. I just I just had a comment since you had called me in. <laughs> so I wrote down what I think Mo basically said. And tell me if I'm wrong and anybody else here in the group is that what I heard you say is we are the experts and what I what that meant to me is people like me who are in the community on the ground who are most impacted people who have had lived experiences are really the experts in terms of the information that needs to be developed in order to create the data and so what I also heard or think I heard was we need to agree on it 
on what it is we what what kind of data we want to get, and then we have to agree on the why. So I think where I think often maybe even this group might get tripped up is like we might agree on something, but if we're not explaining the why, then it leaves out that part, and that's what leaves out the technology part, is that if we're able to explain, not only to ourselves, but to the communities that we're accountable to, that, hey, you've had this experience, so you have this idea of what data needs to be collected, we agree on that data definitely needs to be collected, but then we discover the why is because of this, but the why isn't possible, or the why needs to be in a different form or in a different way. And I think it's really helpful for me, and I think for people that I know who are interested in this subject, is if we were able to create really an issue dump, where we address the issue, people dump in the issues, dump in their concerns of where they want these data points and research be done, and then capture that information, and then really um, figure out how to figure out the why amongst this table. And to understand from the technology experts of like, okay, this is what the communities are saying needs to be collected. And for then this part of the experts to tell us, well, we can only collect it this way, or we would have to do this, or this isn't really possible, or you have to integrate these things like the chief is saying. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think we have to agree on who are the experts and remind ourselves again that it's not necessarily people who are from the state or people who are the technology people, that they are a piece of the experts that we're talking about in this conversation. Thank you. Others, uh, Rebecca. Hi, so I also wanted to throw in my, my reaction to my own question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, also jumping off from where Sheila um, left it, uh, I think, and, and I want to make this a centered focus because we aren't here just collecting government data of the criminal and juvenile justice systems, right? There was a reason why RDAP brought this up to the forefront and why the legislature continues to look to this panel to, to, to draft this, this creature. And, and again, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to bring this to is that the issue for us is the racial equities concerns, the disparities in racial equities in these systems. And I think that what I haven't heard you talk about, Mo, but is absolutely critical, it's certainly critical throughout our report and, our, and themes throughout every meeting of RDAP, is that everything we do is through this lens of, of ensuring racial equities in these systems and correcting the disparities and racism. And, and specifically, and most challenging for us, is how to ensure that whatever system we are suggesting the legislature adopt does not inherent inherit the structural racism problems that we are trying to a understand better and then correct. And so there are parts to unpackage that further. I think that any governance um, structure and anything we do throughout the planning process should remain totally centered on ensuring racial equity, whether or not it's ensuring that we have voices from the community. And I think we need to be even more specific and clear in these meetings what we mean by community. We talked about it here as members of, of, of historically marginalized communities. I think we need to be even more specific of who those marginalized communities are. We also should be specific and clear that we're not just including th those voices in at the initial, let's identify the key narrow questions to make this sizable and, and, and bring it up to start it off. It's actually integrating this, this, um, this position and this, this lens inherently, not just from building and structure, but from the operational uh, operationalization of this. So the data tech, making sure that algorithms that are being employed to analyze this data isn't inheriting flaws that perpetuate whatever racial biases, along with this, and again, speaking from the, the um, Office of the Defender General, where we represent people who have, um, whose, whose stories are so impartially told that we build a data collection system to ultimately give a full story of the whole person, right? And so that we do not distort uh, the, the historic disparities of what is really the underlying issues involved with the people we're trying to actually help. 
And so again, bringing this center to ensuring that the data we're collecting, because I haven't heard this spoken here, but ensuring that whoever's on this governance bill, um, body, community members, key stakeholders who control the information, I, I all agree with that, that those guys with all of these people should be there. We have to ensure that the data of the people themselves that we're collecting is still going to protect them and not be used against them. I understand your history or this organization's history that you're you're part of comes from, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think full disclosure and transparency is, is critical here. But if data collection is coming from a pro-law enforcement use historically, right? And you, you introduced yourself as sort of going back to building data collection sets for use of the FBI. That puts me initially on guard. So I wanna make sure that we as a panel just make sure we are moving forward ensuring the protection of, of these people's data that we are going to be, um, even though protecting in terms of making it anonymous, ensuring that we're not further exploiting or not telling the full story. Thank you. I have a comment to the comment. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I, we often play off of each other in our comments, but um, I actually wrote down something very similar to in a very one sentence shorthand is about that integration being about racial justice and with a racial justice lens and and further than even equity lens, like just really naming racial justice. And so I was kind of curious for Mo of how looking at systems in that way. We can look at systems all different types of ways with all different types of lenses. And so for me, the work that I do and how I live my life is through a racial justice lens. So that is how I encounter and try to either dismantle or lift up systems. So I'm kind of curious of your thoughts around that. And I agree with you, Rebecca, is that that needs to be the focus. And I, I wanted to put out something today, which I don't think is necessarily a term that we've used here, or we've used it very rarely. Um, and I'm going to put this out. I'm going to say the term that we used to have a really hard time with, which is white supremacy. We used to really, I don't know if people remember back in the day, but we couldn't, you know, okay, if we can just have some snaps, people could not even say the words. And some people at the table might still be in that space right now. And that's okay. We'll work on that. But the point is, we could not say white supremacy nor write it in anything. And we got to the point to where it was in our briefs, it was in our reports, it was being said around the table, and now I'm hoping that we actively are able to engage in that conversation and have that culture. And so I'm going to offer, when you start dismantling that white supremacy, what are we doing? And what I believe that we're doing, or what I would like us to do, and to name it, because when you name it, you might do it, and it creates the culture that you want, is to be centering blackness because that's what we're really talking about here today. And some people might not be familiar with that term or what that really means. But when we're dismantling that system and when we're looking at systems through a lens of racial justice, specifically centering the black and brown people who are most impacted, and blackness is a spectrum, just to be clear for those of you who don't understand that, that we need to center that blackness. And so I would like, as we move forward with the meeting, I'll be bringing this back up when everybody gets off and we're just having a more larger discussion, of bringing that term into this space and figuring out what does that mean for all of us and can we get on board with that? Because if we can get on board with how we decided that white supremacy is an issue and is the cause of these systems and structures to be harming us as black and brown and other people, and if we can get on board to affirm that in the direction that we want to move forward in and agree on these terms to make an actuality, I think we'll be in a, in a really good place. So I would like to explore blackness with you all. And if I could just respond to those questions, these are absolutely essential um, issues that you're bringing up. And, and in terms of the governance structure, again, I'm, I'm a tech guy. I, I don't get um, a whole involved in the policies behind this, but you're absolutely right. To accomplish what your goals are, whatever they may be, you are the ones defining what it is that, that um, needs to occur in terms of establishing requirements for a technology system. And, and this is a data collection process of reviewing existing data sets that are out there in the criminal justice field. And so, and then other fields outside of that, maybe education and social services and, and the beyond. Um, but I would just reiterate the fact that, that everything that you're doing, you're doing all of this for a purpose and being mindful of that purpose when you define those requirements um, should absolutely be the, the driving force behind anything that happens subsequent um, to that. So that's, that's all I would say in, in terms of 
how do you direct this stuff? That's, that's totally up to you and whatever your objectives are, that needs to be reinforced um, as you're defining those requirements and then turn that into a technical specification. You start collecting data and then you do analysis on data and then you'll find discoveries on or confirmations of, and, and that's, that's hopefully that if your requirements are correct and, and your purposes um, has been kind of viewed through that lens, you should be able to find you know some some information that that would kind of support um, what you guys are trying to do. So I would say yes, 100%. That that needs to be the focus of of kind of the the governance structure, or maybe even consider it like the board of directors, something along those models. That that you're establishing kind of the parameters, and then asking other folks to be participant and involved in part in and provide the data um, that that you're looking for. And, Witchy? Still on mute. You're uh, muted. Every meeting, every meeting happens. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy that we're having sort of like this, like why are we doing this and really centering that and being mindful of how our biases are gonna play into how we look at data and analyze it. I, I, uh, something else that I wanna bring into this conversation is the limitations of data and the limitations of data collection and then sort of what we do with that uh, because it's never gonna tell you the full story and it's important that when when we you know when as we're developing this bureau of like please tell us all this data you will never be able to have a complete profile of what it is that's happening in our people's lives um and whenever you do this type of quantitative analysis it also it always needs to be informed by the qualitative by people's experiences by going in and together you're able to tell the story and through that you're able to dismantle the biases because no matter what you do your biases will be in there so you need to be consistently looking at how do we keep dismantling these biases as we construct the, the system and that is not only going to come from the data that that we have with the numbers Anybody else? Or can we let Mo unplug? I was just waiting to see if his headphones touched. <laughs> <laughs> let him out of the matrix, as it were. Um, or let me out of my cave that I'm in right now. Let, yes, the lighting has not been good in my office. On to our next part. Mo, thank you very much. That was. Um, You'll certainly be back if you, you know, I, we could just come kidnap you, but I mean, <laughs> but no, definitely. Thank you so much for this. I will this, volunteer to come back. No, this is well, thank you. That's I, I hope it was informative. <laughs> and uh, that, but that was really helpful in getting us sort of focused on where, where we need to go for this working group. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Thank Take you. care, everyone. So I had um, I had a I'm off camera for those of you who joined later. Um, I, I had a number of thoughts and every time I didn't say it, someone else did, which was really helpful. But I just have one more. It didn't require Mo, so I didn't want to keep him any longer. But I'm just um, I know I'm not the only one here who gets really tempted with data, right? It's like, oh, you can give me race, what else can you give me? I want it all, right? And, and I think that, and I agree very much with Rebecca's point, and I'm glad she recentered us on the fact that this is a, a, a panel that's specifically looking at racial disparities, and I agree with that, and that should be our focus. And I can't help but think about the importance of intersection and about how much richer our data will be when we say, well, this, these are the outcomes for black people in Vermont in the system and if you're black and a trans woman these are your outcomes and if you're black and experiencing socioeconomic disparities these are your outcomes and if you're black and under the age of 16 so I just um, I don't even know what my comment is except to say that I foresee that we may want to take a peek at things beyond race in as much as they compound outcomes when combined with race. And I don't know if this system will be designed for that or if even the group agrees with that, um, but I would just put that up there. Well, oh, Evan, go ahead. I'll 
after you. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. And I, if I heard Mo correctly, I think he hinted at that um, because something that I've been thinking about when it relates to the Bureau is we may know what data we want now, but if we're gonna be building this entity, what data are we gonna to want tomorrow or the next day? And at a minimum, and, and it was a little overwhelming to hear how, how big a task like this can be. <laughs> so what, what my mind instantly went to was something Mo said was at least make sure that the entity has the capacity to grow. Even if you can't cover it all today, don't build it in a way where it, it's not gonna be able to function to meet tomorrow's needs. Make sure it's sufficiently nimble. And I think one of the things that we're gonna have to focus on when we make our recommendations in November, which seems so very <laughs> close, <laughs> very close is you know, how, do we, um, how do we make sure that we convey that appropriately for any legislators who might be thinking about the immediately obtaining objectives as, to, as opposed to we need to think about objectives in the long term as well. So I agree, I agree. Let me point out just from, they weren't actually hearings with the legislature. They called them discussions with links <laughs> that were recorded on YouTube, but they were discussions. And there was a lot of discussion about, the, and some feeling, um, behind people who you would think would, are very much in favor of such a bureau, that this was too narrow. That they were initially, they were saying, this is great, we're going to have all this data around the criminal and juvenile justice systems. What about housing? What about education? What about? And that there was some frustration because people were feeling like this was too narrow. I kept sort of going, but if we start, it's better than not starting. And, and also, we're not even addressing what this panel was put together for. Why are you going to start adding things? You <laughs> agree. And there was some of that. There were a few people who were going, hi, this is called the, you know, racial, right, you know, <laughs> criminal, juvenile, just, but, and they got that, but they, they were, yes, but there was this moment of like, and I think that that fits in really well with what you got, I mean, but making something that is supple enough that it grows as needs grow, as understandings of human diversity grow. Someone. Chief Stevens. I just want to say I appreciate all the comments. I just want to circle back around to Rebecca again and say I agree when it, you say racial disparities, that's plural. Um, we have been left behind before just because people focus on one ethnicity. I think we need to focus on all kinds. I mean, even in the health as an emergency, you know, uh, the health emergency bill, we weren't even thought of. So I just want to make sure that we do not lose sight, even though the black population is very important and they have a large, uh, they have a large, um, uh, they're affected a lot by, by uh, criminal and juvenile justice issues. I'm just saying, let's just make sure we don't forget the other, the other ethnic minorities, whether it be Asian or you know the immigrant population or anything else. So I just wanted, to, I just wanted to make sure because we we started talking about that. So I just wanted to be clear to put that out there. Thank you. Can I just respond? Yeah, thank you. So, so I'll just say this in the space for again those understanding because I want to make sure that when I when I say blackness and especially as identifying as a black indigenous person myself is that it's when we center blackness we are including indigenous people native people and all people of color and again it's a spectrum and it's like as we really center blackness then we're centering those people and the priorities and the needs of those people so I just want to make sure that it's clear for those here in the audience and we can unpack that more if we need to but centering blackness means um, not centering whiteness, which is part of the white supremacy system that we've all been indoctrinated in in this culture and in our, at least in this country's um, 
culture. And so that's what I want. That's what I mean by that. And so I just want people to understand that as we move forward in that conversation. Okay. I thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like if there's no objection, to move on to a more nuts and bolts moment, which I think we have to do. And that would be, we got to figure out the working group. We absolutely have to figure it out. And I think, I kept trying to make you not say the N word, which is November. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know you were all nervous, and I, I knew that was going to happen. I, I, I had to say it. I had to have fun. Um, that was good. From you, that was good. <laughs> but you know the November word because it's like I don't want to think about that either. But um, we got to. And I think what we need to do, um, if there's no objection, is we really need to start putting this working group together, the nuts and bolts, literally talk about when we're meeting, who's on it, who wants to be on it, what it's going to require. I mean, that sort of, I think we need to sort of jump in. Um, particularly, I feel, after that discussion that we just had, this is so much larger than some may have thought two hours ago. Can I ask slash comment as a preliminary, as preliminarily to this moving into this nuts and bolts? I didn't want to ask this with Mo because it's not anything he was going to be able to answer or speak to. How, I'm looking at you and I'm looking <laughs> at you, <laughs> are, is this going to work? I, I feel like a lot of what we've been talking about, about who we want input from, um, there may be some overlap with these two additional members, uh, in, in addition to Susanna, uh, who are now statutorily going to be brought onto the panel, who are supposed to be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state, which is one thing we've been talking about, and who have had experience working in information technology or data collection systems, which is also what we want, and <laughs> are going to be appointed by the executive director of racial equity. So where does that fit in? Because I feel like if we're talking about this working group, mm -hmm. it makes sense to, I, I just would like an understanding of what the plan is for bringing those people on. Me too. Yeah. Can I add to the complication? Yeah. Yeah, so um, <laughs> there is a strikingly similar process that will be happening simultaneously in AHS, Agency of Human Services, right. because they are, slash we are, creating a dashboard that will be publicly accessible, um, and and then there's a third dashboard that was also authorized, but we're trying to combine those two because that makes sense. Um, so I, I'm, I'm saying this adds to the complication here because we're also gonna be having a public engagement process around the creation of that dashboard. And I wonder if, you know, one, you don't wanna create fatigue among communities by saying, we're gonna do all these focus groups for all these different things. I think, I think it makes sense to, to sort of combine these efforts. Um, especially because, again, we're talking about the upstream and downstream impacts of health and justice and whatever else. It almost makes sense, but maybe that's a little too much sharing. But I just wanted you all to know that um, a similar process is going to happen in a different space. And so we will be engaging a lot of the same stakeholders and communities that that other process will be engaging. And we may want to figure out a way to relay that so that it's not confusing, exhausting, or inefficient. When are you doing this? Who even knows? Okay. I mean, so so this is um, it's a grant funded project with CDC money that's supposed to take place over two years. I think we're trying to get this done as quickly as possible. So I can foresee it happening in the autumn, but I might be way wrong, and I can fi I will find out. Okay. Let's let's note that. Hmm. Well, I feel like I shouldn't talk, but I, I, <laughs> I, I had a thought, and I, I, if we're gonna just put complication out, let's just do it. Um, 
I was reading Wong, and on page 20 of Act 65, um, it, it says, the report shall address, one, where the Bureau should be situated, taking into account the necessity for independence and the advantages and disadvantages of being a standalone body or being housed in state government. Like, we haven't talked about that before. Um, fine. Two, how and to what extent the Bureau should be staffed? Like, we haven't talked about that before. Three, what, the scope of the, what should be the scope of the Bureau's mission? And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's pretty much what we what we've been discussing since about ten past six is the scope of the bureau's mission, and not merely the scope, but also the character. What my point is going to be is that question points four and five for the report for how the bureau should conduct data collection and analysis and five the best methods for the Bureau to enforce its data collection and analysis responsibilities is in some wise a separate issue. What I was getting at here was that these earlier questions that have been amplified, made more nuanced by Rebecca, by Sheila, by Susanna, by Jessica, um, by Evan, that all of those need to really be defined first. Because as Mo says, those more technical questions are 100% dependent upon those first questions being answered. So what I would recommend is whatever this working group comes out being, that it starts out with these initial questions of, in a sense, policy. And then we move on to those more technical ones later. And I don't want to pretend that there's a hard separation between the two. But I'm just trying to put some, I'm being a little bit like Carpenter here in sequencing. Let's do, we need to do this, and then we need to do this, and then we need to do this in order to get to this result by the 15th of November. Um, and I'm suggesting that the working group, however we're comp putting that together, because as, as you're pointing out, we've got to worry about the, think about the two new people, or three new people. Um, and then, of course, these, uh, these communities that we want to address, to embrace. But that seems to me a first step, and that this ne the next step around the more technical stuff about around the architecture of the data dashboards and the public facing data dashboards is a second place that we kind of put off for the moment and really then clear our minds for focusing on these preliminary huge and frankly central questions. So I'm putting that out there for discussion. I will commit to picking people as soon as possible without rushing it. Why, thank you, Director. <laughs> I'm kind of curious what the process is for that, like what goes into your process. Yeah, so um, initially, um, I, I have had the great pleasure of um, meeting slash being introduced to a lot of people around the state. And um, one of the things that's always sort of irked me is that whenever we have a new committee or a panel or a working group or what have you, it's like the same 12 brown people mm -hmm. always on it. And so a goal for me is to have uh, people who don't necessarily have a direct line to government or people who, don't necessar who aren't necessarily part of that regular rotation. Um, and then, of course, I mean, it calls for people who represent the interests of communities of color and who have experience with data. Um, so that, that kind of just narrows it for us. Um, so I think a lot of it is going to be the networks. If you know anybody, send them my way. Um, given our timing for our other projects, I don't know if it's prudent to like put out a, a call um, 
and I don't think an application process would be appropriate, so I really mm -hmm. am just looking to um, people I, I have known or people known to people I have known. I think it would be useful if there was something like a call put out to our call just because of the communities that I'm connected to. We could blast it out to our communities and our mm -hmm. networks and it would be easier than me putting together a blurb or something or word of mouth than it would be to be like, hey, I vouch for this or this is my involvement with this. Can you, or are you interested in this? And we can put it out to our communities and maybe there are other people. I mean, um, I have a network throughout the state and so I would love to be able to um, actually just do that last call out to see if there are any interested people because I think giving that opportunity might, might, might have people come your way. And we'll write something else. The other thing I forgot. And it can be real simple. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. Real simple. Yeah. The other thing I forgot to mention was um, when we created the Racial Equity Task Force, um, there was a, a record number of applicants for that. It was 164 people. Oh, and, um, and they gave wow. such thoughtful answers and reflections in their um, applications that I retained those and created a spreadsheet of people's <laughs> interests and uh, was also going to cross-reference that to see if any of them would be interested as well. Great. Uh, but I will write something up and send it, and you all should really, I'd be grateful if you'd share it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So. Chief, oh, I'm sorry, Chief, please. Do you want Chief Stevens and then Chief? I just wanted to say it would be helpful, Exana and um, Aton, that um, if we can define what is paid, what isn't, um, what time commitment it is and what it's not, because it's really hard because we had also mentioned, you said earlier, Aton, some things are funded, some things aren't. Uh, then Exana mentioned the CDC or, or some other grant through AHS. So if, if we can kind of define what it is you're looking for, how much time commitment that you you feel it's going to be and what that that cost is. Because I know what hinders a lot of us because we see the same native people on the same committees and commissions because everybody works. And most of the stuff is held during the day instead of in the evenings or time where people could actually do um, could participate because they have to take time off from work or lose vacation or whatever. So I think that part of this structure, there might be some off hours work needed potentially, or at least be able to compensate people for losing the time uh, that they're at work. So I, it'd be nice to define that if you could, if you're, if you're looking for people so we can at least try to go out and say, Hey, here's an opportunity. This is what it looks like and contact people if you need it. So, Thank you. The first thing that I was, oh, Rebecca. Oh, wait a minute. Representative Lalonde. <laughs> just back to the comment you had made before, just a couple things. Certainly the thinking on that number four and five was more technical issues as far as how to collect the data and enforce the data collection. Those are closely tied to number one as far as whether it's an independent or if it's within the state. True. And, those, those, and you're right that four and five follows primarily from number one and number three mm -hmm. uh, in there. And, and that was the thinking as well behind that. So it, it may be you know, much, well, I won't go into whether it's easier or not if it's independent, but you know, that's a consideration, those number four and five. That's a good the other thing I just want to make sure is that this is building on the good work that was in the December report and was in the bill as introduced that laid out. These are all the data points we believe that, or that our DAP believe we should be right. gathering, and this should be building on that as right. well. So, okay. And Thanks. separately, real quickly, I mean, if there, if there is, I mean, we, we really struggled with trying to figure out how to appropriately compensate. And, and we were hamstrung by that. Right. It's something that you and I have talked about we're gonna yes. take up again uh, next year. Uh, but there is the $50,000 that can be used to contract with some somebody. If there's somebody who hits all those points and isn't available to join, but has a, has a, has a business that we can contract with to help us out with the data and the uh, input with the communities, that's an option that's out there because of the money that right. we managed to get, so. Thank you. Yeah. I thought, yes, Rebecca. Hi, thanks. And so, thank you for um, sharing um, your thought process in, in selecting the, the next two community members for the panel. And, and we do look forward to, to having them join. 
Uh, but I appreciate you taking your time and 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 what you're doing, which is you're trying to just find the ones who would not necessarily um, rise to the top in terms of readily uh, known names. And I very much appreciate that. I wanted to throw out a specific consideration to add to your basket of <laughs> things, a further complication possibly, but I like to prefer a, a critical, a critical insight that we could benefit from. Someone who has been supervised by the Vermont uh, state government system, corrections, uh, law enforcement, been experienced with Vermont law enforcement, or fam, you know, a family member who has. Again, so that we have someone to provide that perspective. Yeah, it's an excellent point. Thank you for that. I wanted sort of back to where you were, Chief. Um, I'm thinking back to last summer when we were doing something very similar. Um, and I want to use that as a model, or at least that's where my thinking is. Um, I think, to your point, Chief, this should be something that meets in the evening, around this time. I think initially we should agree, as we did last summer, to meet once a week. And if we need to meet more frequently as things go on, because we can't know, um, we will jump off that bridge, as I like to say, when we get to it. Um, but that would be my proposal, that it is an evening meeting and that it meets from, you know, what? We can argue that, 5 to 7, 5.30 to 7.30, 6 to 8, whatever, something in there. Um, the other thing that I think is really critical here, um, it's troubling to say that there was anything good that came out of that pandemic, which is still not over in most of the world. It's not um, over here. Pardon? It's not over here. Not even over here. In Missouri and Tennessee, <laughs> for instance. Um, but that one of the things that I think came out of that that was useful were remote meetings. Um, I say without any question, the work that the subcommittee did last year to prepare that report for December would not have happened had that subcommittee had to meet in person. I just, I, it would not have happened. No way. Um, the voting process itself was, it, it would not have happened if we had to all be together. Not everybody could be together. Um, we did that electronically, you may remember. Um, it, it worked brilliantly. So I'm going to suggest also, not only that we meet once a week, but that we do it as we did last year. Given that there are open meeting laws, we do need to have a space that is you know, available for people to come. However, um, we can be doing what we're doing right now because there are a bunch of you who aren't actually sitting here, who I still think are two-dimensional. So um, those are my recommendations. Once a week to begin, in the evenings, and that it's a hybrid model. In other words, if you don't want to show up, but you want to be on the subcommittee, you don't need to show up. We'll figure this out. I mean, we figured this out. I show up, you mean show up physically. Physically yeah. show up. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. There, that, that, that like had a lot of it. You know where I was going. But yeah, physically show up. But those are my um, those are my thoughts on putting this together. Can you address Chief Stevens' other question though about compensation? The compensation question I'm going to throw to the Attorney General's office, because the money went to them. Yeah, so it went in accordance with the standard statute, which we currently operate under, um, which is exactly what this group had proposed that we not do. Right. <laughs> but that is what the Appropriations Committee has decided to do ultimately. So it is the standard compensation, which if I remember correctly, is $50 per meeting and 
mileage should you accrue mileage, and that's at the standard rate, which is like fifty six cents or something. Yeah, I can't mile. remember. That's something that like that. So that's what it is. Um, you know, that's right there in the law. We are our office is bound by that, um, and and that yeah. So that's where we are on that. Hey, Tom, can I also task uh, the AG to check into things like what the, I think the legislator was mentioning about where it was housed and, and like, what was that, four or five or whatever the report. Can we, can we have the AG look at if there's any legal constraints of where that data can be housed since a lot of it is collected through uh, the courts and also police and other types of, like, I don't know if there's any any uh, restraints or restrictions about that data and where it can be housed or it has to statutorily be housed just before we start going down that road about like in other words we we may not be able to give all the court records to a nonprofit that isn't associated with the court system or the state i don't know i don't know the answer to that but somebody should check in before we start deciding where it's going to house and we find out later that we can't do it legally or we can't do it statutorily or whatever. So if that that's something they can do behind the scenes without even um, without even uh, being part of this discussion, at least. Is that, Is that certainly we will look into that. I mean, I think that will have to be part of the discussion that the subcommittee has. Um, the only thing I can think of right off the top of my head is that there are federal constraints around criminal record retention, but that's all stuff that we will work on on the subcommittee and figure out what the limitations might be there. Okay, I didn't know if that was something that there was some known or unknowns that could be done outside of the committee and that would that would help guide the subcommittee where that might go. You know, I, that's all I was saying is some of that could no, be I, a legal check. Yeah, and that's a good, no, it's a good point. I can try to do some preliminary work, which I actually have, our office has done in dealing with diversion pretrial services issues. So this issue is not unknown to me. And uh, I can do a little work on summing up my knowledge. I actually don't think it'd be too hard to cure any problems because the state already does it. And we have buildings that comply with federal regulations right now. My guess is that this is something we can do, but it's a good point. And I will look into what might we might need to consider there. Yeah, because you're talking all this, all of everyone moving it into one repository and and I didn't remember if there were some issues when uh, some of the I don't know if this is um, who was the data collector that was giving us all the reports from the state police or whatever didn't they have some constraints of getting data from certain organizations that they were working with that there was some anyway it doesn't matter I just didn't know if there were some rules around it so I'll, I'll drop it there and I'm just saying we we think we should think about it or have some look into it yeah okay Good question. Um, so I have a friendly amendment to what I had just um, proposed out here. Is of course it's friendly. Um, of course. Is that um, I am I feel comfortable with um, what you suggested, but I think how long would the group be meeting for if we're meeting for months until November? I would definitely like our first meeting to be together so we can know each other, maybe get sure. to know each other, be in physical space together. Fine. I think that that might be important and maybe even on a monthly basis, but I don't necessarily, if we're meeting weekly, feel the need to have to meet weekly in person, but at least a sort of a um, soft requirement to meet at the first time and at the last time whenever we yes. make the decisions. Sounds great. Sounds great. Um, I guess what I would propose, if anyone doesn't have a better idea, is that by Friday, Ian, remember that I'm saying this because I'll need your help because I'm old. Mm. Um, a doodle poll to figure out times that are good for all of us, for people who want to be on it. I am not, one of the things that I thought was very interesting about this act, I was expecting it to be very clear about the composition of the subcommittee, like a quorum will be, you know, X number of people. It's not. So if y'all want to be on it, you know, it's cool. It means, you know, we're going to be doing this once a week, folks. We're going to be seeing each other initially all together. And then, 
we can all go wherever we're going to go as long as we have a computer. Um, and then at the end, the same sort of thing. Um, so I'm not going to get worried about who's on it. I'm really not. Um, I, the statute says not to. <laughs> the statute's pretty clear. Um, one question I have is, what do we want the subcommittee's relationship to be with the full panel, or what do we want the what do we want the product to be that the subcommittee is going to be presenting to the panel, and when do we want that done so that the full panel can work on this report? Which I also, I mean, I also know in addition to the five points you raised, it's supposed to contain draft legislation, yes. which will take time to put together. Yes. I mean, we're going to need time after we get the subcommittee's report. Oh, okay. don't be silly. <laughs> um, David's going to look into that, too. No yeah, we'll let David do <laughs> Just give, that's right. our new <laughs> phrase. Just give it to David. They got 50,000 <laughs> bucks for this. Come on. Maybe we'll consider um, report the draft. Right, just give it to David. Um, what we did last year was the subcommittee, which was not the full panel, yeah. the subcommittee, um, we, the panel met every month as usual, yeah. and the subcommittee brought its work to the panel, presented it to the panel, got feedback from the panel, and then scurried off and got and did subcommittee things. Based okay. on what the panel had said, so it was like a monthly progress report. Correct. Okay. And correction. Okay. And it was a process of correction as well, because we got a lot of you know I mean we got a panel. There's a reason for that. People who weren't on the subcommittee for whatever reason were just really good about you know we met every month. Um, there were certain occasions where there were documents I had to remember to send out, so people would have them. There was re. That was that actually worked really well. That worked really well. We were really in a lot of um, good communication around that. There was a lot of good back and forth. So that that doesn't worry me so much. So so I will offer as you're getting close to the legislation drafting to work with somebody from the committee because I have access to the legislative council who can help put it into draft language. Bless you. So, <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Bless you. Thank yeah. you. OK. Um, I, too, am old and don't retain information. So yeah, forgive me <laughs> if I should know this and don't. But who is, I'm just looking at who this subcommittee is supposed to consult with. Who is the Vermont Chief Performance Officer, and who is the Vermont Chief Data Officer? I can say that. Uh, the Chief Performance Officer was Sue Zeller. She retired, I think, last month, May. Um, she is in, that, that role sits in, in agency of administration. Um, currently, Justin Kenny is standing in as the interim Chief Performance Officer. Who couldn't make it tonight, by the way, I'm sorry. I should have. And who is generally excellent. Um, and the Chief Data Officer is Kristen McClure. I actually don't know what agency she's from. ADS. Okay, great. Um, and th th I didn't hear from her, but I should have said in the announcements that I had invited the chief performance, the interim chief performance officer, and he wasn't sure he'd be able to make it. He he knew it would have to be remote. We sent him the link, but I gather. Um, no, that's it's just it's even helpful to know that you have already kind of reached out to. Them oh. to to yes. To make that connection. What is ADS, the agency for? Agency of Digital Services. Um, well, I just wanted to point out, too, because we're now learning about this hybrid model of meeting in person and via Teams, that people have been point, uh, putting comments in the Teams comments oh. feature. Mm -hmm. But folks, folks participating remotely, not everyone has their computers and their Teams apps up. So some folks might not Good be point. seeing your comments. I mm. propose that Definitely for our meetings going forward, we designate somebody who will monitor that activity. I I agree. I agree. And so, volunteer to be that person too, if I'm in, if I'm here. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Great. Do we want to see the, if we need to address anything? Yes. In the I'm I'm reading. You are really. Like, yeah. You can see that. <laughs> I can. I can't see what's here, but you know, over there. It's right. great. 
You know, sometimes it's great to read out loud for people who are watching. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Accessibility. I'm just. I'm just saying. If you're going to read it anyway, you can read it out loud. If you really good point. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila, for making me feel like an idiot. But <laughs> I can read it. What the hell is wrong with the rest of you? You didn't want to brag about it. So no. I <laughs> the first comment is from um, Julie Scribner, and it says, "Excellent point, Aton. Uh, if we can do it remotely slash hybrid, I think that is a way to get better participation and commitment." So I assume that that is in response to the plans for the sub. Committee. And then Chief Stevens also commenting on the plans for the subcommittee says, I just want to say that once a week is a large commitment and, uh, and ask of people, not saying that is good or bad, just making a statement, will these subcommittees be open to people outside of this panel or only panel members? That's excellent. Yeah. Um, Because what ended up happening with the subcommittee last year was it was kind of open, kind of not, which doesn't really answer any question in any substantive way. Because we had a lot of people coming in who were helping us draft the report, but who were not voting members of the panel. And it's kind of vague. It just says, for purposes it's very of developing vague. the report required by subsection A of this section, the panel, the panel, so I guess that's voting members of this panel, yeah. shall create a subcommittee working group. Right. But as you pointed out earlier, it, it could be whatever we want. It could be whatever we want. <laughs> well, and that goes back to if there's other people part of the subcommittee, then would the AG be able to pay them for being on that subcommittee? Um, because I mean, I may, if I'm the only native person that kind of limits this. And if there's a whole bunch of other community members that might be able to do it, that have expertise, it would be nice to say, Hey, why don't you uh, join the subcommittee? And you know, it's 50 bucks uh, once a week, if you can do it. Great. Um, but I just want to know if there's limitations because, um, it sounds like if Exana, you're you're going to be bringing in a couple of people as well, right? That yep. they're going to be part of the panel. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. So that's the two questions: uh, Will they get paid from the AG for attending, and can there be people outside of this panel on the subcommittee? The only thing I'm going to put forth here, just in terms of consistency with what this body has done, long as I've been on it. Voting members, however, are voting members and not everybody gets to vote. So it's that's it. You can't. In other words, community members and I'm not disparaging community mm -hmm. members, but it can't just be, oh, I'm going to come to the subcommittee and and you get to vote. Well, consultants too. consultants too. We're not on the panel. You're not on the panel. So. Uh, with regard to compensation, to Chief Stevens' question, this section about compensation says members of the panel who are neither state employees nor otherwise paid to participate in the working group in their professional capacity shall be entitled to per diem pursuant right. to the statute. Mm -hmm. So it says members of the panel who are not otherwise paid mm -hmm. to be to participate in the working group. So I oh. take that to mean that if it was community members who are not members of the panel but who wanted to participate in the working group, they would not be eligible for the per diem? I would read that it the same way. I would read it that way, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Unless they're established a performance-based contract with them. Yeah, that's okay. true. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's particular expertise of somebody who um, would meet whatever the AG's requirements are for a performance-based contract, that's what that $50,000 is available for. And I bet for that. that I bet that Chief Stevens has people in mind who <laughs> would be Right, yeah. I mean, you, you're, to Chief Stevens's point was yeah. that if there are people in various communities sure. who have particular expertise, and frankly, just being a member of being a member <laughs> that is yeah. expertise, to Sheila's earlier point. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so that's an interesting way to think well, about it. Well, I also, just, just for instance, like um, the reason I'm saying that is one, I don't want to be the only pe person representing. The Abenaki community because I'm not I'm not the sole entity so 
it would be nice to have other people representing us and like going back to what Exana was saying, it's nice to have different faces who might, I mean, I know, I'm not saying that I know people, but I mean, just the old, just say, for instance, the old chief of police, uh, I mean, uh, who, um, not chief of police, the old chief of Missisquoi, Eugene Rich, was a patrol officer for a lot of years. So he, he has the native side, but he also knows the criminal justice side. I mean, that might be a great person that potentially might give insight from both directions. I don't know, but I, I'm not volunteering him. I'm just saying there are other expertise out there that maybe could be tapped into if they were able to be compensated for doing it instead of it, them doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Because, uh, yeah, I just want to say that because a lot of people, they're afraid of sticking their neck out and creating policies because they're going to become, well, why'd you do that? And, you know, <laughs> you know how it all goes, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so it's nice to be able to have that, that, um, that other voice other than the same people that you see all the time. I'd like to echo that. Thank you, Chief Stevens. I'd like to echo that as a person like um, in my sitting here in my black body and and often being the person who comes to the table. And I'm thankful that I'm able to come to the table and thankful that I'm able to um, be here as a representative of some of my BIPOC peers. But I want to be able to not have just me at these tables and want to create access to more people who have varying levels of interest and um, and um, expertise to come to the table. And without money at all, especially for those communicants, like this is almost off the table now. I feel like for most of the people that reach out to, because already I agree with Chief Stevens as well, that weekly is huge. And even for me, who's here and been in this capacity for years is huge for me. And um, somebody who is not up to speed, who did all the things that must happen to get to the table, I don't, I feel like we're perpetuating the same system that we're trying to undo. That's the bottom line. And it's frustrating for me to sit here and to acknowledge that we've created um, or have not moved beyond um, really understanding the need of certain things in order to do what we need to do. And fundamentally, that's paying people what they need and what they're worth to be at the table as the experts that they are. And so it is going to, either people are going to give that out of their warmness of their hearts, um, or it's going to continue to look similar to the way that we're trying to dismantle. And I, I yes, on the other hand, I am bound by what I'm looking yeah, and I totally understand what we're bound by and making a point that I'm it disappointed that, that, we've, with, that we've gone so far on this panel that it hasn't been justified. Like, I, I don't understand why the state statute has to be like that way or we can't go outside of that in a different fund to create something else. And maybe that's my own ignorance in the space and maybe that's also a question I'll put out to those who could answer that. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about, okay, fine, that's the state statute. But okay, fine, then where's another part of money right. that isn't the state statute that we can give these people to be at the table? I guess would be my creative solution really from this. Or is there a grant funder or somebody else within or outside of the state that funds and is looking at racial equity? And maybe, I'll, I don't know, maybe in your wheelhouse, that's looking at racial equity and looking to fund actually racial equity that's what I would call grassroots and most impacted people and getting them at the table. And part of that is getting people at the table, compensating them for being at the table, which is money, mileage, sometimes food, et cetera, whatever. So I'm just wondering, like not to close the door that, oh, the state just said we have this, but that's not all we have. The state is not the only resources we have. That's mm -hmm. just what's being discussed right now. Do you, well, that's yeah, not fair. Maybe, maybe I'm telling there's a way around this too, is that you can keep, Keep mentioning that you can create a contract for expertise, uh, but maybe the Humanities Council could be that person that the contracts with, and then they they uh, allow people through them to come on uh, for the community members, like what Sheila was saying, because we ask so much of our community to do stuff for nothing, and and sit on all these things which take away their time and their money from their families. Maybe, maybe that contract with, I think the legislator uh, was talking about, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't remember who that was, but. Mark um, Lalonde. Right, part of the statute was allowing to contract with someone to pay for that expertise. Maybe we find someone who can be that 
contracted entity that they could bring on those people that we're talking about as the subject matter experts or something, not necessarily those employees of that company. And I don't know if that would be a nonprofit or a humanities council or something, something that could be that contracted person to bring on the expertise. I don't know. Maybe that's a weird way around things, but maybe that's not the way it should be done either. But I don't know what's legal and what's not when it comes to that definition. Well, I'll take this discussion as an assignment to figure out what we can possibly do. I actually think, Chief Stevens, your idea might work. I like it. Contracting. Fiscal conduit. Basically, contract with a non-state government entity that can provide the sort of paperwork that's needed to cover and then have that person, have that entity bring in people. So anyway, we'll think about what could be workable. So just a couple real quick things. There are limitations on what those performance-based contracts can cover. So it can't cover just any kind of expertise, and a lot of it's technical. But I also know that through the Social Equity Caucus last year, we had a working group that we were able to fund much more reasonably, but it was through the Vermont Community Foundation. And I know that Representative Christie actually really, actually Representative Christie and Representative Colson helped us set that up. So that would be another possible approach to get some broader input. I'll leave that to David to touch base with Coach Christie, because I'm going to be on vacation for a couple weeks. As Martin said, to be clear, there are, we are going to run into a lot of limitations. But I think there's some creative thinking going on, and I'll see what we can figure out. Thank you. And actually, I appreciate that you said that, Representative, because it speaks to the importance of having that conversation with the community about what they want counts as skill, knowledge, expertise, technicality, et cetera. So there, I mean, it's tangent somewhat. I already spoke a little bit with uh, A-Town about this, and, and uh, Representative Christie and I, when we ran into this issue in, in appropriations with the per diem, kind of committed ourselves to trying to take a run at trying to change that per diem. And maybe I can chat with you about some of your ideas yeah. as well. To have compensation that's more appropriate, particularly for these communities, we keep on going back to and, and asking for free time, and, and mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. So, mm -hmm. and we're gonna have Sheila come and uh, testify for for it as well. <laughs> for free. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be calling in. <laughs> good point, Chris. Good point. That, good point. Good point. Good point. Well. that was so easy. I got a high rate. I got a high rate. That was that was, like, that was great. We had two good oh, jokes today. Oh, that was really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what I'm, we're, we're getting close to the witching hour and people got to, well, at least here we have to go home. Um, not casting aspersions. Uh, I will, by Friday, if everyone like nods their head, I don't think we need to vote on this. Um, I'll put a doodle poll out to the panel about what's a good night. Did we ever settle the question about whether non-panel members could be participants? I mean, I think they're going to be. I don't think there's any way around it because all of our consultants are non-panel members. I think so, it's just a decision. Oh, sorry. So it's basically going to be the same structure where people advise, mm -hmm. opinionate, give us fee, give us expert, whatever, and then ultimately the panel makes the decision. Correct. It's mm -hmm. basically what. So Correct. these subcommittees will bring recommendations to the panel. Correct. Okay. But won't be actual voting people in the actual final decision making. What she said. Not voting at the point of panel, but if there is a 
vote, I'm assuming an informal voting procedure that goes on within the subcommittee. It's also, I would expect voices to be equal in a subcommittee. Or, so, you know. yeah. We, <laughs> we did. No, but, no, I was just right. speaking from the did. point because I was on the okay. subcommittee, I think it was, right? I was yeah, on the subcommittee. You were on the subcommittee. So, yes, we had full reign on decision making, and the way we chose to do that was by consensus. Right. And it doesn't mean we necessarily agree on everything, I want to make that clear, but we came to a consensus on what the points were we were going to do, and made those recommendations to the whole panel as and Eton they voted. expressed before, then the panel gave us feedback, critiques, opinion, all the things, and then we went back and did it again, and kept going back, until we were at a place to where I feel like we were in consensus yeah. mode as a whole, because we did that process in a way that I feel was a little bit more authentic in terms of allowing this subgroup to take on this body of work, but yeah. making sure that we weren't leaving the voices out of not only the panel people, but the community people who showed up and showed up to be able to, to add to that as we structured that in the subcommittee. So I'm assuming We're gonna do that's that the way it would go again, because it was a fairly effective It worked well, I felt. I felt. And, I, I just, and again, whoever was talking earlier, I think it was Rebecca, let's not reinvent the wheel. Mo was saying it too. Let's not reinvent the wheel. We got a really good report done with this process last year. And I feel like, first of all, it worked, and it worked well. And secondly, we ain't got a lot of time to reinvent the wheel. Just saying. So the comment on your scheduling, I'm just wondering as, so, f and, and again, this doesn't have to revolve around me and not to necessarily say I'm gonna be the a person on the subcommittee, but again, going back to what Chief Steven said and then what I said about wanting to have that representation and being concerned that if I'm not and there isn't that ability, especially as a voting person and that capacity to, to be on there, I, it makes me go like this in terms of want my involvement. So basically what I'm getting at is, by choosing a day of the week, that might be hard for some of us because I know like I, um, there are certain nights that I have, but it's not necessarily I have all Tuesdays for the month. And so I'm wondering if the days can be flexible when we have, because you said let's pick a day, which I love having a day where it's just that thing. And I want to acknowledge that maybe people have things that are like this and maybe picking a day every single week may not work for people. And if that's a variable on your doodle poll that you can consider. Okay. Figure it out. I'll figure out how to put like it Like it could in. be like the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday and the second Wednesday and the fourth Wednesday. Like, you know, something to where okay. it doesn't necessarily for those of us who, I know you looked a little puzzled okay. of what I was trying to communicate. So for those of us who, again, might, again, I know like right. if we were to pick Tuesdays, I'd be out. Right. That's all I'm saying, because I have other serious commitments on Tuesday nights. Well, it's good to know that now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not going to be Tuesdays. <laughs> um, okay. I will figure out how to do this with your help. We will figure out how to do this. Yeah, um, I, uh, I was wondering if, uh, if the Doodle poll is going to be distributed by Friday, Will that mean that we need to have a solid idea of who is going to want to be on the subcommittee before Friday? No, because I think people will vote, and I think we'll get a sense of it from there. Okay. And does that include, well, okay. The contract people, we're, we can't, there's going to come a point where we cannot take everybody into account. So are, so I guess that's my question. Are we just taking into account panel yes. members when we're doing the doodle yes. poll, not community, we, uh, we not contracted? Not we gotta, there's got to be a line, because otherwise we'll never get anything done. And the, the subcommittee, in my mind, can consult with really whoever they want. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, yeah. and if it's going to be working on a consensus basis, and they can take the input of anyone they consult with into consideration to a certain degree, you know, it, People can have their voice without officially being in the subject, sure. hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we That's did that point. last time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we did that last time. So, so I uh, will get this going. I got work to do between now and the end of the week. Great. Uh, anybody else got stuff they need to bring up? We're at new business. That wasn't enough business. <laughs> more business. But I know that that does seem a little perverse, doesn't it? Got um, business. Yeah. Got business. Got 30 seconds. Go. Okay. Now that you mention it. 
Stop shouting. I'd like to see you guys shout. I have a mask on this time. At the last minute. <laughs> okay, so then the next meeting of the full panel, which is not to say the subcommittee, the next meeting of the full body will be the 10th of August which is the second Tuesday of the month, um, which is when we always meet, second Tuesday of the month between 6 and 8 p.m. And we will be obviously sending out a lot of emails. In the, I mean, David's got stuff he's researching. He'll keep us abreast of that. The doodle poll will come out. And we will start putting together when the subcommittee is going to start getting together to start doing this. Is that all right? Good. Anybody want to say, let's go home? I motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor of adjourning. Aye. 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 Aye.